You are watching T Radio V, radio in TV. The Social Action Media Network and T Radio V present Creating Good Work Live with your hosts, Ron Schultz and Greg Franks. Well, welcome to Creating Good Work Live, where week in and week out, we uh, are dedicated to bringing you the finest in social innovators and social entrepreneurs uh, who are solving many of our pressing social issues today. I'm Ron Schultz. And I'm Greg Franks. And today we're, we're delving into the realms of consciousness and business. Now, to some that may sound oxymoronic. But if it does, and you're in business, uh, you better wake up a little bit here because the, uh, the you're going you're gonna to be finding the business world kind of moving beyond you, and uh, be because what was once thought of as um, kind of the soft part of business uh, has rapidly become a very pragmatic approach to uh, creating healthy businesses, and as things would have it. Uh, this is exactly the perspective of our first guest today, and uh, Runa Bouyas. And uh, Runa is Icelandic, as you will hear from her voice, if you know, if you're, if you can recognize an Icelandic ac uh, accent. And and a former CEO and serial entrepreneur, turned uh, change catalyst, conscious leader, mentor, author, and speaker. Uh, Runa co-founded the Conscious Leader Network, the Together Network for. Per Pur purpose-driven female entrepreneurs, and the Conscious Capitalism LA chapter. Uh, we're very happy to have you with us today, Runa, to talk about this kind of growing shift in consciousness and business. Well, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. So let's, let's begin. As, as the only entrepreneur I know from Iceland, <laughs> <laughs> why, did you, why did you share with us how you got started in business? It was totally accidental. I, I had no dreams or vision to become an entrepreneur. I didn't even know the concept, but uh, uh, I, I stumbled onto, um, uh, you could say, playing with importing cosmetics. I, was, uh, I had a background in cosmetics. I was an esthetician working in a beauty salon. My employer uh, wanted a particular brand that she had gotten used to in Germany, and it just so happened that a friend of mine had access to someone in Paris that was distributing this, and, and he kind of tricked me into starting importing this to Iceland as a hobby. And uh, <laughs> as a hobby, and um, with, with that in mind that he would take care of the business side and I would take care of the, the more therapeutic or, or sales and marketing and training side. And, uh, and I had worked for Lancome uh, Cosmetics in Iceland a year before that. And uh, so I had connections with all the stores in Iceland and I was able to bring this brand into all these stores. And then my partner, my friend, uh, wanted to do something different. And I, I wanted to give him back that brand because it came from him. And he mm -hmm. said, no, 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 this is yours. So. I had to decide whether to abandon the ship and let all my customers down that had uh, taken in and invested in this because of me, or simply just jump and learn on the job. And that's what I did. So I is this um, normal uh, activity for a, a woman in Iceland to be running a business? Uh, in those days, it was not normal. Uh -huh. uh, and I, but I, I have to say, I was so young and so ignorant that I didn't even think about that. Mm. I didn't think about that I was young. I didn't think about I was a female and maybe I shouldn't be doing business because I was a woman. I, I, just, I was just passionate and I think wanting to be of service and not letting people down that had trusted me. Mm -hmm. And that was really my drive. And, and when I was approached by the French embassy uh, that had people from Paris looking for an agent for a perfume brand, and they uh, called me in for a meeting, and, and I did everything to tell them to go to some of the bigger companies. And they said, no, we, 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 we want to bet on you. And then I had to really decide whether this was uh, going to be a hobby or, or become a serious company. So mm -hmm. I, I, that was my turning point in that. But it wasn't until much, much later that I realized that for some people, seeing a woman in business 
wasn't the norm. It was when I was being interviewed by business magazines and they would ask me, how is it to be a woman in business? Uh -huh. How is it to go to a bank manager? How is it to deal with your uh, competitor? <laughs> 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 But but I it, it, for me it it was it was just I did not have anything in me that said I couldn't do it because I was right. a woman. Right. Well, what led you to Santa Fe? Uh, yes, uh, adventure. Not, not not a very Icelandic place. Not I, at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going we're going forward about twenty years. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, for about twenty years an entrepreneur in Iceland, and at the end of my time there, I started to sense and feel that something was missing for me, and I didn't quite know what it was. I was doing extremely well. I was profitable. I was serving my customers. I had fabulous uh, company culture, uh, a great uh, stakeholders model, you know, uh, taking care of everyone in the, in the equation. But there was something that started to be missing inside of me. And today, I know exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. It is what we talk about now as purpose. That what I was doing was, yes, helping people, particularly women, in many ways, with their confidence, with their empowering them to, to step into their beauty, step into their comfort level. But it still felt superficial. Mm -hmm. And I... Uh, I felt that there was so much, the world was so big, there was so much out there I wanted to explore. And, but I needed to start with myself to explore what that purpose was for me. And there were a lot of other things that happened in my life. I decided to sell my businesses, and at the same time, I lost my husband. Mm. Um, he passed away. So I found myself in a, in a new chapter in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I had promised my husband to raise our two sons as a cosmopolitan young man. He, mm -hmm. was, he was a Dutchman and very international. Uh, and I knew staying in Iceland wasn't going to do the job. So I thought I would start in Europe. But before that, I had, we had friends in Santa Fe who, whom I had been training with. It was a psychologist and his wife. They had been to Iceland many times to, to give um, seminars. And I had been a uh, uh, dedicated student for a few years with them. And they invited me to come over with the boys to do some training with them out, out in the wilderness, which mm -hmm. I found interesting. Yeah. So I came with the boys for planning to stay for a few weeks and ended up staying for a whole summer. And that whole summer ended up extending to 13 years. Yeah, that'll, do, that'll happen to you in Santa Fe. <laughs> so le let's talk a little bit about how this mix of entrepreneurship and business and uh, the exposure to complexity thinking in, in the Santa Fe Institute, how this all shaped your, your thinking? Um, uh, yes, uh, Santa Fe is definitely a very different place and it introduced me to so much more diversity than I was used to in, in Iceland. And I was lucky to, to have access to the Santa Fe Institute and, and the amazing minds that are there playing with all kinds mm -hmm. of sciences in a mix. And um, just briefly, let's, let's just say uh, the Santa Fe Institute is one of the leading uh, institutes in the world dealing with the sciences of complexity and complexity thinking. And it is really quite an extraordinary um, bastion of uh, a mixture of, of how these sciences that we've all come to know from biology to physics to chemistry to all these things, how all these actually biologic science sciences all work together uh, in these kind of in create these out of these complex states have something new emerge yes and and I was introduced to all of that by my then new partner uh, in life Brian Arthur who uh, was at that time working at the at the Institute son of Institute he had uh, headed the the first economy program there and uh, so I learned from him about the interdependence, the interconnection of all things, and um, how nothing was 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 in in constant balance. How things were up and down, and and uh, and, and it it just being with Brian for 14 years. I mean, you, you you it's strange if you don't get affected with those kind of uh, conversations and and traveling with him and and meeting a lot of the scientists up mm. there like Mary Kalman and, and others <laughs> so that was one thing and then other things that happened um, I was on a deep journey of um, 
you could say apprenticeship and training in, uh, I, I want to call it conscious leadership. Uh, I was working with uh, Native American people. I was working with uh, a teacher who takes you out into nature. Um, and uh, talking about interconnectedness and understanding how we are mm. all connected when you are out in nature, you're right. There's no way to, to avoid that. Yeah. We're going to have to take a break here already. But I w what I would like to do is I've got, we have, in, in terms of conscious capitalism, we have a, a very brief, f about a 50 second video that I'd like to, to play and then let that play us into break. And then when we come back, we'll, we'll further our conversation about this. All right? Great. So if you could uh, roll that video, that'd be great. A movement. An approach to conducting business and an organization dedicated to advancing all of these. Conscious capitalism comes to life as it's applied to business, nonprofits, and other organizations. It's about more than business as it advances the power of business to serve humanity. Four core principles guide a conscious business or other organization that practices conscious capitalism. These four principles, higher purpose, a stakeholder orientation, conscious leadership, and conscious culture support entrepreneurs and business leaders to create value for all, building trust and creating healthy, resilient, sustainable businesses. We'll be right back with more Creating Good Work Live. question that needs to be asked as well as answered is what is it that we can do that is unique that is impactful i am estella pifer this is my brilliant bus we are going to empower every individual and every organization to do more and achieve more i had an idea a bus that brings technology to kids that need it most but i look in the mirror wow. It's this process of continuous renewal, of showing courage in the face of reality. If you dream big enough and believe in your dreams, you can make it happen. Showing that courage in the face of opportunity. Open your eyes. Los Angeles is one of the top destination cities for human trafficking. If you see something, say something. Call CAST. Your call remains anonymous. Interpreters available. Human trafficking is all around us. Open your eyes and let them lift theirs. Welcome back to Creating Good Work Live on T Radio V. Well, we're we're back with Runa Boyes and uh, Greg. You're leaving Santa Fe and coming to Los Angeles. Let's talk about that. And you're advancing through the Conscious uh, um, uh, Leaders Network. Tell us about the Conscious Leaders Network and how that evolved into the conscious capitalism uh, of Los Angeles. Right. Um, when I left Santa Fe, um, I had already gotten to know a lot of people who were in uh, various types of organizations that had different names, spirit and business, consciousness and business. There was a, a conference in Santa Fe that, uh, that was uh, about international conference on business and consciousness that I started to attend and speak at. So that was kind of prompting me in this direction that, uh, that there was actually possible to bring the, the things that I was learning at the Sound of Institute and I was learning out in nature and all my, you could say, my own personal self-growth and, and, and development training into business, which was always my purpose. And when I came to Los Angeles 2011, I uh, met uh, someone who had very similar ideas like me. Uh, we both wanted to bring 
these ideas to people in business and help them with uh, through education, through networking, through uh, peer learning. Uh, and we had uh, monthly events that we invited people to, to talk about these things and talk about what's happening in your business and, and how are you dealing with uh, challenges and conflict that are coming up and are there maybe different ways than we've been dealing with that that we could learn about. And um, we ran this for about a year and a half. Unfortunately, we didn't have a sustainable business model. So we were one of these startups that had to fold, which was an experience in itself. Uh, but uh, later on in 2014, I was approached by some good people here in LA, uh, some that had been with me at the Conscious Leader Network and others not. And they were interested in forming uh, the Conscious Capitalism LA chapter. Uh, because now the conscious capitalism movement was was not just a movement with one or two conferences a year. It was starting to have chapters all over the world. And uh, I jumped in and uh, was part of the founding team that brought that chapter here. Also tell me, how are the millennials uh, embracing and shaping the future? Oh, uh, I think the millennials are a godsend mm -hmm. <laughs> because they are pushing us to look at the issues that, that my generation uh, has resistance to. They have such a different outlook on what work means to them and, and how they want to contribute and how they want the workplace to be. And what that is doing is it's pushing those uh, that are running businesses to think about what kind of culture they are, uh, are building and, and how they can, their biggest challenge is how to engage the millennials. And what I say is learn what it is the millennials are wanting and needing and see how you can bring their gifts and talents and energy into creating the new world. Uh, one of the biggest things that the millennials are looking for, which they have in common with the conscious capitalist movement, is that they are looking for purpose what we call deeper purpose or evolutionary purpose or higher purpose. They don't just want to work for a paycheck. So for them to work where the only focus is on the bottom line it doesn't work very well. Right. So w when, we're, when we're talking about, so we're, we're talking about these millennials and how they're kind of sh shaping the business world and, and helping shift the consciousness of the, that world as well. One of the things that they do bring is this uh, is, is a much better understanding of social media and technology yeah. than than uh, some of us who gave birth to millennials uh, have. So, but th th there's one thing, that, one issue about that, that that concerns me, and, and that is we still find a sense within the social media, within the, uh, a sense of isolation and disconnect. Yeah. What, what's your thinking about that? I I think there are two types of millennials. There are those that are unbelievably conscious and awake. They seem to be uh, born that way. Maybe they had parents that were like that, so they got imprinting from that. And then there are the millennials that are not as conscious, and they are looking for connection. They are looking for belonging through social media, through all the likes on Facebook, through the Instagram. And it's a search f that is not going to take them anywhere uh, except to disconnection. Mm. So. And those are the millennials that uh, are really difficult to have in organizations because they are not focused, they are uh, disillusioned, and, and they have a problem. So I think we have a lot to do to educate them about uh, what, what really uh, is happening with them and why they might not be feeling as good as they, mm -hmm. their self-esteem is very low. So we have to help them to, to with their confidence, and we have to educate them about the addiction to social media, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and that comes to what's important when we are talking about conscious business, conscious leadership, and that's wholeness. Right. So you had to come to some of this awareness, too. And we have a, we have a very brief video here of, of you talking about some of your journey that I, I think that would be worthwhile showing at this time. So uh, if you're ready, well, let's, let's take a look at that. And um, I took up skiing, which I had never had time to do because I was always working before being the robot. And um, as I was sitting in the elevate, uh, ski lift many times, I, people would say, so what do you do? And the answer that I started to share with people was I'm learning to be opposed to do. 
And I said that because I realized that through my 20 years in business in Iceland, I was really, really, really good at doing. I was really good at action. I was really good at making things happen. But I was completely lousy at being. It was a new concept. I was in, I could feel impatience, intolerance within me. I realized these were qualities that were not going to serve me long term. And I knew I had to change it. <laughs> You see? <laughs> yep. So as, as women leaders and entrepreneurs become um, more and more prevalent in the workplace, uh, what shifts do you see taking place within the consciousness of business? How does, this, how does the impact of women help shift that consciousness within business? Uh, women uh, function very differently from men. Uh, I, I think we all know that. <laughs> and uh, the more women uh, are invited in or take their place in and, and step into who they truly are, uh, we start to understand that there are different ways of doing business. What used to be called the soft skills that we could talk about as empathy, caring, kindness, love, even uh, connection. Um, they are now, I call th these the new hard skills, or I actually put the two together, soft skills and hard skills, and I call it the human skills. And I think women innately have those and, and bring that. If they haven't uh, turned into more of the, 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 the men's way of being in business, a lot of women that have been in the corporate world for a long time, they have taken on, unfortunately, a lot of the the, the men's ways, so they need to be decoding themselves. Well, you know, it's interesting, because really, there's, there's, there, there's been a lot of studies that have shown that women on boards of directors, when a company brings a, it, even one woman yeah. on a board of director, yeah. increases the bottom line of that organization by four to five percent. Yep. Uh, and, and that's why I am absolutely promoting having more women on boards, having more women in, in the investment world. So this is part of yeah. one of my new direction yeah. uh, because I think we need that to create conscious business. We need more women, uh, not just to, for equality, but we need the energy and the qualities and the attributes that women bring. Yeah. Tell us where you're headed. Where I'm headed. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, Ron talked about technology. I, I am fascinated. I'm fascinated about business. I'm fascinated about entrepreneurship and being in Los Angeles. You know, what a great place to be for entrepreneurship at the moment, the Silicon Valley and all of that. I am fascinated by technology and what we can do with technology to use technology to solve our uh, problems in, in the world. Uh, and. But I want us to use that technology with mindfulness, with consciousness. So that's where the conscious leadership piece mm -hmm, comes in. Good. Uh, so I, I am really excited about supporting uh, leaders of all, all gender, of all age groups, to come together to, to create new uh, technology, to create new businesses, new products and services that can advance human mankind that can help us to uh, not only heal, but regenerate our environment, that can create happy and, and healthy and uh, uh, creative workplaces. And um, so I see myself, uh, again, as an educator through speaking, through, through mentoring, through, through training. And also, I'm, I'm starting to put my feet, my, we could say my little toe, into the investment world because I think the investors need a lot of education so they understand why they should be investing in these new types of companies. So in, the, in this last minute that we have, last minute, what, talk to us a little bit about women investors. Women investors, they're very, from what I'm learning, mm -hmm. uh, there are very few women investors compared to men investors, and that's a big problem. So when women uh, are going more into, into entrepreneurship and when they are looking for uh, investors that understand what they're doing, uh, they often are looking for women investors, but there are very few of them around. So we need more women investors. Um, it's happening, but it's happening slowly. Hmm. And uh, I, I know, uh, and I've been going to a number of events here in Los Angeles where women in tech, for instance, are looking for investment. And uh, 
women investors, there are just very few and far in between. And that's something we need to change and we need to grow. Mm. So supporting women with money, let's, let's talk and see how we can, you, you can support what's coming. That's great. Well, thank you, Runa. I really Thanks. appreciate you coming on today. Thank you and, for uh, having me. W you know, for, for being here with us on Creating Good Work Live. We're going to take a short break, and after that break, we're going to talk to, uh, um, to Robert Reichner about the Awake Business Conference. So we're going to continue the theme. There's more to come on Creating Good Work Live. Most anti-bullying efforts rely heavily on bystanders to take action, leaving your child with no protection. The No app aims to change that. Now your child can summon the assistance of a policewoman to tell the bully no, and you get alerted in real time with a map of your child's location. With video evidence, the bully's parents can be confronted, and school officials can be forced to take action. You get increased peace of mind, and your child gets increased self-confidence. Sustainable Law Group is a different type of law firm. Our clients are primarily social enterprises, nonprofits, and green businesses. Our mission is to provide legal counsel that is aligned with our clients' values by providing integrated, sustainable, and comprehensive solutions. We're a full service law firm. Starting a benefit corporation, cooperative, or nonprofit, the attorneys at the Sustainable Law Group are ready to support you in all stages of your business. Find out more about Sustainable Law Group at sustainablelawyer.com. And now, here's Ron and Greg. And we're back again. Um, our next guest is uh, Robert Reichner. Who, uh, Robert is the uh, CEO of, Re of Repair Shopper and a former senior producer for Disney uh, Playdom. And prior to that, the co-founder of Offbeat Creations. But uh, Robert isn't here to talk about any of his various business enterprises, um, but, talking, but rather to uh, join us today to talk about the Awake Business Conference, which is uh, shaping up to be quite an event uh, that's going to be taking place in March of this year. So uh, Robert, hope you're there. Welcome to Creating Good Work. And Thank you. Really glad to be here. That's great. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the Awake Business Conference? Yeah, so the Awake Business Conference is uh, coming together in Austin of uh, this coming year, as you mentioned, March 30th through April 2nd, and it's really an event designed to uh, to uh, welcome a cross-disciplinary section of people who come from every kind of direction. It actually originally um, uh, started with a, a group of people in Austin. Um, there's a, a psychologist and myself as a, as a business leader. And it's kind of a grassroots movement that is looking to bring together a group of people to dive into what it really means to create business today in this age of, uh, as we know, mindfulness, uh, in the changing business models and the economic structures that we see in the world, and bringing a, a, a rather new perspective to how all these come together. So what was the in inspiration for this event? Uh how did, how did, and how did you actually, I'm interested in the inspiration, but I'm also interested in how you moved that inspiration to action. So it's a good question. And I think the, um, the, the how part of this is actually one of the key pieces. And this began with uh, conversations with a group of people in Austin. And I think it's, see, it was uh, people who don't necessarily have a business background meeting people who are actually already transforming the way that, uh, that the cultures within corporate settings or small business settings, the way that those are developing, and seeing the power really to bring um, new modalities, new ways of thinking to business and to, uh, to bring together people to share those discussions. So w while it started with um, just the seed of inspiration from um, 
uh, a woman named Ikcha, in fact, uh, in, in Austin, she realized that actually the core of business is relationship. And that cracked open this new perspective. She was used to seeing people coming through, for instance, her therapy practice, um, expressing the tremendous um, kind of disillusionment with business. And that opened this possibility. And she began networking within Austin, eventually reached out to me. And, uh, and we came together and realized, hey, we should really uh, bring together a set of speakers and uh, a, a giant group of attendees to, to discuss this. Hi, Robert. Uh, we understand Hello. there are some wonderful presenters that are going to be on the program. Would you tell us about some of them and what exactly they're bringing to the table? Yeah, it's quite a range. So um, the keynote speaker, um, Sakyung Mipam, he's actually a meditation teacher. Um, we have Bruce Dickinson, who's the CEO of Cardiff Aviation, but some people may know him better uh, in his incarnation as the lead singer of Iron Maiden. <laughs> uh, Chad Mang, who uh, some people know as the jolly old fellow from, or sorry, jolly good fellow from Google. Yeah, he's and not that old, is he, Robert? <laughs> he's not that old. <laughs> um, and I think what's shared is this different view of the way that we can actually um, meet uh, employees, business owners, shareholders, and, and communities, and transform the way that we actually create uh, economic activity. So there's also a philosopher, Charles Eisenstein, who's going to be there, Michelle Maldonado, who's a, a longtime meditator as well. We also understand there's going to be some breakout sessions. Could you tell us about those sessions? Yeah, the, the sessions, I think uh, the experiential aspect of this is important. So those sessions are going to be a chance to really go much deeper. Um, you know, I think that as you asked uh, about how did we actually move this to action, there's tons of books on this subject right now. There's actually a lot of conferences. And um, what I've found in my own experience is that you can read all the things that you want. You can hear as, as many lectures as you want. But changing that and actually transforming the behaviors and the cultures of our actual day-to-day -day environments, the way that we relate to our own employees, the way that, um, that we actually relate to our customers, the ways that we think of our suppliers, that actually takes a different kind of work. And so uh, there will be meditation instruction here, for instance. Um, and I think that that's an access point, one of many where people find that you can actually take a, a view, take something that maybe is just this idea in your head and actually introduce it to people um, and to, to share it so that it, it actually goes deeper and you can start to turn the ways that we're more, maybe more familiar or more conditioned to relate to these topics. The, you know, it's, it, it's really exciting, Robert. I, I wanna, what I'd like to do now, though, is that we have a, a really brief video that um, of the of the Sak Young Mipam Rinpoche, just to kind of give a sense of uh, of of who is showing up and and the the kind of tenor, and then we'll we'll talk about the the some of the bases for this for this program as well. So uh, we can um, like a circle, and uh, my father very much uh, was working with this principle of completeness as as a human being, and I think that's something that we can explore. And I certainly invite you to do that. And I know that's something that's um, sort of going forward in this particular time. Uh, we are all too familiar with being reminded of the faults of being human. And even when we use the term human, it, it usually indicates faults. That that's very human. And I think, you know, it's sort of interesting from that point of view. And the way that we're using the word human is uh, the notion of completeness and almost perfection. Not that we do not make mistakes. We make obviously a very <clears throat> sort of a lot of uh, stupid mistakes, and we also, you know, on a daily basis, and uh, we also, you know, as, as a global culture, we make horrific, uh, we do horrific things, and that is completely unclear. And what I want to express is that this expression of human goodness, how it can influence culture, isn't coming out of some sort of a naive approach to life. It's not just a new age trend, by the way. Um, and, you know, I was, I was joking, my father left the inheritor of a 2,500 year tradition of, of Buddhism. 
So he was the kind of cornerstone of, of tradition in his culture. And then, as Richard said, he got off the boat here, and then he was considered New Agey. So, <laughs> something happened on the boat right now. <laughs> So uh, let, let, let's after after that brief uh, you know, talk by the Sak Young, let's it, is the Awake Business Conference uh, grounded in a particular uh, tradition, uh, or is or is it, and would you just consider this a mindfulness conference? Oh, we're not hearing Robert. It's not uh, grounded in a particular tradition. I think that it has a connection. Obviously, um, Sakyang Mifang, who we just heard, is a, is a Buddhist teacher. And there is a connection to mindfulness. But I think what we've seen is that uh, mindfulness is something that's actually accessible to uh, people from a broad range of backgrounds. Um, there isn't anything uh, particularly, um, say, connected to a tradition about human beings having minds. Um, mm -hmm. I, I found that most of the pe people I've encountered over time <laughs> do, have, um, do have that, and that's probably the only prerequisite. Um, and I, I think that uh, this is really a chance for people to experiment and to experience a, maybe a, a slightly different way of being together, which uh, they can actually take back then and, and work further with in their own setting. Well, well great. We're, we're going to we're going to take a, a short break here, and uh, and then when we come back, Robert, we want to talk a bit a bit more about uh, who will be attending this conference and um, what they can expect as well. So um, we'll be right back with with more of creating good work live, and we'll look forward to it. You're watching Creating Good Work Live on T Radio V. I'm starting a political action committee, being able to make up your own narrative and be able to incorporate all of these terms. It was really, really fun. I am a religious scholar and an astronomer. I teach the Muezzin how to read the sun so that he could pick the perfect times of prayer. If a man rents his boat to a sailor and the boat is wrecked or goes aground, the sailor shall give the owner of the boat another boat as compensation. Most anti-bullying efforts rely heavily on bystanders to take action, leaving your child with no protection. The No app aims to change that. Now your child can summon the assistance of a policewoman to tell the bully, No! And you get alerted in real time with a map of your child's location. With video evidence, the bully's parents can be confronted, and school officials can be forced to take action. You get increased peace of mind, and your child gets increased self-confidence. We're back with Ron and Greg. So uh, we're back with our with our guest Robert Reichner, and uh, Greg, tell us uh, who do you expect to attend the conference, and how will they benefit from this conference? Yeah, we've already seen uh, we we put t tickets on sale just recently, and er we've already seen good sales. Um, I, what I'm hearing is that uh, there's a range of people from corporate settings, so people who are working in larger companies. Uh, myself, as a as a member of the startup community, I'm very interested, and I'm 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 looking forward to being able to mix with people from different backgrounds. I was just talking to someone who's the executive director uh, in Vermont uh, of a nonprofit that actually works on labor force development. So. What, what you're seeing is people with diverse backgrounds coming together to, um, to exchange uh, the ways that this 
is beginning to develop in their own communities. And so I think that there's this opportunity to, uh, within the networking setting, um, and we'll be making sure to, to allow a lot of time for people to be able to mix, but to be able to exchange these ideas and really work through what's being uh, seen, heard, and experienced. What would they learn from this event? Well, I think that um, one of the opportunities, why, why this is different, again, from, say, uh, reading a magazine article or uh, simply watching a TED Talk, is that you actually get to be in an environment with people in a different way. And so a lot of care is being uh, taken to create a setting where people are invited to be together in a different way that's actually modeling some of the, some of the behavior, uh, some of the ideas, the, uh, the philosophy, and also the results of research that are being expressed throughout the conference. Very cool. Now, I, I want to, our guest previously this afternoon uh, had started the uh, Conscious Capital Los Angeles chapter, and I know that you have uh, Raj Sisodia, or Sisodia, did I pronounce that correctly? But uh, who was who had uh, kind of helped found the uh, this conscious capitalist movement, and I'd like to to show you this kind of brief video that we have um, of of Raj and uh, what if we're ready for that, gentlemen? Let's let's see that. Well, I guess we're still setting up, and uh, but uh, this is this is you know, again this is connecting us with this notion of, of, uh, of the shift in business. So uh, let's, let's go to that video now. People are looking for something more. People are looking for something more in their roles as customers, as employees, as community members, as suppliers, and so forth. So businesses that actually operate with that higher purpose and with that stakeholder orientation will ultimately win the battle in the marketplace as well. In our book, for example, we found that these firms outperform the market by nine to one over a 10-year period, even though they're paying their employees in some cases double what their competitors might be paying, even though their suppliers are profitable, and so they're not squeezing their suppliers. They're investing heavily in their communities and, and supporting all kinds of activities, uh, and they're also paying taxes at a far higher, a higher rate than the average corporation tends to do. So that seems somewhat contradictory. You know, this seems like you know, that they're, they're creating something out of nothing. But that really is the essence of what a business is supposed to do. It's supposed to create value. So that, that's going to be uh, one of your guests at the Awake Business Conference. So uh, how, is this, how is this going to be different from other large business events like, uh, conscious cap like the Conscious Capitalism Movement or uh, perhaps Be Inspired? Well, I think it, it complements them. And uh, I... I I think that we benefit from the growth in these kinds of events. Again, I'd say that it's um, the difference is probably in the, the way that we're creating an environment for people to actually experience what it's like to be with a group of people in the way that we're modeling mm -hmm. or taking back to our own companies and our, our own cultures. So if I have to choose between, because I can only attend one conference, uh, why should I come to the Awake Business Conference? I think uh, there's not any other conference currently that offers this range and this breadth and depth combination of those two in terms of uh, uh, this kind of a, a conference. And I think that the opportunity to spend time with people <laughs> who are uh, experienced in the diverse areas of this is really unique in the United States. So, so Robert, what, what do you think is going to be the, for you, the, uh, the most important aspect of, of this conference? Where do you, where are you going to be focusing your attention? I'm, uh, I'm particularly interested in, um, in Sakyong Nipam and also uh, Charles Eisenstein, who's going to be presenting on, he has a book called uh, Sacred Economics that actually talks about the, this new phase of economic activity that we're in. And I think that um, there's uh, the breakout groups in particular, the opportunity to, to join a specific track, a whether it's based on uh, meaning sacred or, um, or um, 
on there's a, a, a track that's on on race and actually uh, cultivating different understandings within your company of that. Interesting. Now, do, do you, what do you know about sacred economics? Um, well, I've I've certainly studied it. I think that what's what's important is uh, the shift from a purely transactional and almost um, uh, I think you could say some kind of system where you're extracting value mm -hmm. to really developing uh, systems that are based on exchange to dissolving externalities, which I think is like an, is an illusion that we see in the world and mm -hmm. in economic activity, the sense that there are, um, are consequences that actually don't have um, an impact on our individual businesses. And actually, uh, to looking at a broader impact on society, where we're actually putting um, uh, the kind of the um, the essential uh, kindness, I'd say, and the the natural impulse in people to to give and to exchange, um, to put that at the center of business and to to really um, emphasize that. You know, I, I find this real interesting. This is an area that, uh, that I've been working in recently as well. And uh, I see this as, a, as a, not only moving away from the transactional, but moving more and more, as you were suggesting, toward the relationship, our relationship to economics, our relationship to money, our re relationship to value, our relationship to worthiness, our own self-worthiness. And uh, I would suspect that that's part of what's going to be discussed in this as well. That's exactly right. And... I think that that's something that you really need to be face-to-face um, -face with other people. You need to be able to actually meet and to, um, to, to connect person to person. And I think that's the unique opportunity of this conference. So the, the, you know, within that, with it, our, our, our cast just before this was, came out of the complexity um, uh, thinking, need to be able to actually thinking process uh, and Santa Fe, which was um, all related to this, this notion of emergence, right? You and I interact, something emerges out of that interaction that is greater than the sum of our two parts, but not wholly uh, inside either of us. And so that the, this process of uh, economy as an emergent phenomenon rather than economy as uh, purely a transactional uh, event, I, I think can really help shift some of our, our relationship to, uh, to the economy as a whole. That's absolutely right. And, and that's really the, um, it takes a, a certain view and a certain collection of, of people, of talented people to come together in a creative way to do that. And that's the purpose of the Awake Business Conference. Well, how can individuals who are interested in uh, attending register, and where can they learn more or secure more information about your program? Yeah, so we've, we've set up a website, of course, awakebusiness.org, and that has uh, everything. that has the speakers. It has uh, information about the, the dates how to uh, look at purchasing tickets, how to um, spread the word and, and include other people. That would be the place to go. Right. I think we have a contact card for that and uh, that we can put up so that people will know how to find, uh, there you are, Awake Business Conference at awakebusiness.org. Go figure. So, uh, so Robert, I, I really appreciate you come on to, coming on today and, and helping us with this and uh, helping us understand why this is going to be a dynamic and, and worthwhile event. I think the, what you've been describing in terms of the um, impact of this event, in terms of what people will really gather from, gain from it, and uh, as one who has been at conferences both with uh, Chad Ming and uh, the Sak Young and, and many of these other speakers, I can uh, I can say that it's going to be uh, quite an event and really worth the the time spent both not only listening to the folks who are going to be presenting, but also interacting with the folks who are going to be there. Great. Well, I really appreciate you having me on the show, and uh, and thank you again. Well, great. Thanks, Robert, and uh, thank you all for being here on uh, creating good work live. Uh, our show next on Wednesday. Uh, or actually next week is going to be um, 
Well, it's going to be one that you're just going to have to tune in for. It's going to be quite exciting. And uh, for, for myself, Ron Schultz. And Greg Franks. Thank you for being part of Creating Good Work Live. It is a production of the Social Action Media Network on T-Radio V.